So today we'll finish our discussion of gravitational waves, and next time then we'll begin with uh, cosmology. Uh, so I, I hope that today, in fact, we'll have some some more time for discussions uh, and questions about gravitational waves this part of the course. But just to make sure that we have that, uh, are there any questions so far? What we have been doing. Uh, you sometimes used to be much more focused with the gravitational waves. You seem to be a little bit lost. Is that correct or is that not right? Uh, yeah, a little bit uh, about the mathematical. Okay. So, do you have any questions to ask or something? Uh, yeah, but like maybe after class. After class. Good. Please, please ask me. So, because I will clarify things and then you can be on the same wavelength. Okay. So, yeah, so this is the last part of gravitational waves and the same. And what we saw the last time was really how this derivative of, so these are the radiative modes, information about gravitational radiation um, is coded in this derivative operators D on this class, or more precisely, these equivalence classes of derivative operators. Uh, we are led to these equivalence classes because we have this conformal freedom. And these derivative operators satisfy properties, and they satisfy some condition. In particular, they annihilate the, uh, the, the, the metric. So the uh, DA operating on the metric is equal to zero, and similarly, DA operating on NA equal to zero. So DA. C equal to zero, D and B equal to zero, all on sky, all the equations hold on sky up here. These properties then imply that DA is completely determined by its action on uh, one form LA. such that NALA is not equal to zero. So just for definiteness, we take it to be equal to one. And you, in terms of if sky were embedded in space time, you can think of this N as being a null normal <coughs> to cross sections of sky. And so a convenient choice of this L, we saw, is that we can take sky, which is S2 cross R, And then um, we can just choose a cross section. This cross section says C, or C not up here. And then given this NA, we can just drag this cross section. So you get a nice foliation. Um, and if in fact, um, if you have U as an affine parameter of N, then I, this could be U equal to U naught, U equal to U1, and so on, these cross sections. We get a whole bunch of family of cross sections up here. And for each, each of this cross section, each of these cross sections C that we got here uh, uh, comes with a LA such that LA times TA equals zero for all tangent vectors TA to the cross section. So any vector to the cross section, then the statement is that there is a one form. This is basically this is a one form which is normal to this cross section within scar. So we get that, and then and, and then the, the, with, with the choice, then it will follow that LA. Uh, we, we can just choose L at on one cross section such that LA and A just normalize it such that that is equal to minus one, and then on some C naught then that would just say that LA and A you could minus one everywhere on sky and ln of L equal to zero. So these cross sections are lead dragged by N, the L is lead dragged by N and we get this frame. And then some time ago when we did the peeling properties, we saw that I can also construct the vectors N and M bar, which are tangential and drag them and I will also get 
a Newman Pendle's tetrad in that case, which is M, M bar, N, and L, up here for one cross section. But at the moment, we're just looking at the scribe by itself rather than scribe being embedded in the physical space time. So the important thing is that the that, that D is completely determined by this DALA. And then the statement is that I can take this DALB and I can take its uh, trace free part. So Q, M, N, D, M, N, N, times Q, A, B. This half is because the metric is zero plus plus signature. So it's a, and this is what we call the shear. So this is shear of L, but I would not always write L. This is the shear tensor, and the statement is that the shear tensor is what characterizes this auricular class. In other words, every derivative operator is completely determined by its action on um, by its action on, on, on LA. So therefore, DLB, this, this will tell me what the derivative operator is, but two derivatives can be conformally related by a conformal factor, which is equal to one on scry, but its derivative is not one on scry. That just says, that just adds a trace term to this DALB. So if you remove that, then the equivalence class of derivative operators we get, which are radiative modes. So this is the radiative mode. That radiative mode to which our derivative operator belongs is completely characterized by the sigma, and this sigma is symmetric. It is sigma is transverse to n and sigma is stressless. And we saw last time that even though the metric is degenerate, it's inverse as an ambiguity, but if there is a transverse, but sigma is transverse, therefore that ambiguity does not matter. I can choose any inverse here to say there is stressless. And if you like, this sigma is what one, one often uses as we saw last time. Okay, so this is where we were, and now we would like to continue. And uh, the, the point now is that basically, um, that if I look at the derivative operator, uh, okay, now in fact, we, we, we did a little bit more last time. We saw that in fact, there's also, fr from the curvature, from the conformally invariant, part of the curvature of D, we can construct a new tensor. So basically, the DADB, we can construct a new tensor. So basically, you take DADB, any covector k on, on the scry, that this will be equal to the Riemann tensor, three dimensional Riemann tensor, AB. And the point is that the, this is only determined by really the, 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 the derivative operator D, because the metric is degenerate. And then this derivative operator D up here, sorry, this Riemann tensor up here has some symmetries which says that this is completely determined by, let me get the sign right. Um, um, by tensor S up here. This is completely, de this determines the Riemann tensor. And this S with the downstairs indices is just obtained by lowering the index with, with a Q. So if you like when going from this tensor to this tensor, we lose a little bit of information. But for the bonding news, we just look at this tensor up here and basically in the bonding frame, We go to a body frame just to kill the conformal freedom, and in the body frame, then the statement is that new tensor is given by CD minus one half uh, CD to CD. So that is the body, and then the statement is that this is. I'm just stating these facts that this is actually conformally invariant. So if you choose one body frame, 
you'll get one answer. Somebody goes and chooses another Bondi frame. I told, told you that there are three parameter family of Bondi confounded frames, which make the metric Q on Scry a unit to sphere metric. So uh, if we change this um, Bondi confounded factor of the Bondi frame in this confounded class, then the statement is that you're not changing this new tensor. And then what we saw was that the flux of energy and momentum <coughs> through any region of Scry. So you can take some region of Scry up here, for example, this region of Scry. Let's call it delta Scry. So the flux of energy through delta Scry is given by integral delta Scry times just NAB times du and then d omega. This is just d to omega phi. This is just sine theta d theta d phi. We need to stay metric. And the flux of the momentum PR is just given by delta scry times alpha i. And these alpha i's are, are the first three YLMs that I wrote down last time. So if you are interested in z-directional, the alpha z will just be cos theta. In the y-direction, it will be sine theta or sine phi. And in the x-direction, it will be sine theta cos phi times So one thing that you see immediately is that the flux of energy is always positive. This is a manifestly positive quantity. And this really kind of resolved one of the key points about what are gravitational waves. Because the question was, are these physical, as I told you in the beginning, are these physical, are these physical um, uh, entities or are they just coordinate effects? In one coordinate system, something may look like a wave in another coordinate system do not look like a wave and the question is well what is the physics here and the point is that you can just calculate this bondi news if the bondi news is not zero that there are gravitational waves because they actually carry this this energy away from the sources so the sources if you like are in the interior somewhere in the interior inside the space time and i got the energies being radiated away and that energy then passes through sky up here and that is the formula for body, body energy. And this really was a key point in the debate that was going on about reality of gravitational waves in the early days of general relativity. By early days, I mean, you know, almost 40, 50 years after the in discovery of general relativity. I don't know if I mentioned already, but uh, Einstein had already in the, soon after the discovery of general relativity, a couple of years later, between 1916 and 1918, Einstein had written a couple of papers showing that there are gravitational waves in the linearized approximation. And what he did was, he just repeated the kind of calculation we do for electromagnetic waves. For electromagnetic waves, if you have a charge, but it's a dipole, so positive negative charge up here, and if it is oscillating, then the time rate of change of the oscillation of, the, of this dipole moment you can solve Maxwell's equation with this oscillating dipole as a, as a source, as you know, and then you can see that there is radiation that is going up. That is what is happening everywhere where we have Maxwell field. Right? I mean, the time varying dipole moments are creating this, this, uh, this uh, Maxwell fields. So Einstein took a time varying quadruple moment of a source, and in the weak field approximation, showed that time varying quadruple moment actually does radiate energy, and there are gravitational waves, and if highlighted this as a big difference from Newtonian gravity. But then, in subsequent years, there was a lot of confusion about whether there are gravitational waves in full general relativity because of the coordinate effects, you know, how do we separate these things out. And, that, and I, it's very interesting because in 1936, I think, Einstein wrote a paper, or 35, 36, Einstein wrote a paper with Rosen in which he thought he had proved that gravitational waves, in fact, do not exist in full general relativity and that it was an artifact of the linearized approximation. And this is a very famous paper in which you know, it was submitted a physical review, and then it came back with a 10-page reference report, which we now know was written by Robertson of the Friedman, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker, Warren, that Robertson, um, pointing out the error in the paper. And it is a big, big story that goes on here. Uh, ultimately, Einstein actually, okay, so maybe some people are not aware of this story, so let me just go and say it. So it came back from physical review. Einstein was completely, you know, not happy because in, 
we have to understand the culture, cultural context. In Germany, when he was, um, you know, a member of the Prussian Academy, there, just like for the Royal Society, the idea was that Prussian Academy members went and read a paper and then it appeared in the journal. I mean, it, it was, it was, there was no referee process. And so he was very surprised that any, the paper was sent to a referee. He did not know that the referee pro process existed. Wrote a rather scathing reply back saying that I did not, to the editor, saying that I did not authorize you to send this paper to a third person without, you know, before it was published. And, uh, I, and I, in any case, the, the comments of the referee are erroneous. And anyway, I'm withdrawing it. And he submitted somewhere else. He just withdrew. It's very interesting because the editor of Physical Review was a young person and why he chose to do this is not, is not shows a great wisdom in his, on his part, but it's not completely clear. Because the same year, Einstein had sent three papers, the first two of them, Einstein Rosenbridge <coughs> and Einstein Rosen Perovsky, called the mechanics of experiment, both of them were published without sending to a referee. But this was sent to a referee, probably because it said that something which was true in general, linearized gravity was not true in full general relativity. Um, and so, uh, I mean, there was confusion about, and, and, and Einstein wrote a very clean, le clear letter to, to Max Born saying that with an assistant, I have now shown that gravitational waves do not exist in full general relativity, although we are achieved, although it, it was, they do exist in the linear as approximation, but that is an artifact of the approximation. In the full theory, there are no gravitational waves. So you can see how, I mean, it's Einstein, right? <laughs> not somebody else making a mistake. Um, but then it turned out that by the time the paper, so he sent it to the uh, proceedings of the uh, uh, annals of the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, actually, and um, and it was immediately accepted, and then he got the proofs. But between the time that the proofs came back, Einstein realized that there was actually a mistake, and we still don't know exactly how he realized it, um, that there was actually a mistake in the paper, and so he corrected it, and the final conclusion is completely different. It is not that gravitational waves do not exist anymore, right? And these are the Einstein Rosen waves that we now talk about. Uh, Rosen, on the other hand, until 1980s, continued to believe that the gravitational waves do not exist. So it, it was quite a, uh, quite a, in other words, he did not accept that there was a mistake in the paper. By the time Einstein changed the proofs, Rosen had gone as a postdoc. He, Rosen was from Israel, he's a very famous Israeli relativist. Um, he, had gone, he had gone for a postdoc in the Soviet Union, so Einstein did not communicate with him when he actually made the changes in the proofs. <laughs> so Rosen was not happy about this, and he did not believe that gravitational waves exist until, until about 1980s. And, and proofs conferences that where you can see this being discussed. So you can see that there are a lot of confusion. And that is why in the 1960s, when Bondi and his group, and then later Penrose and Newman, uh, analyzed this uh, and showed that in fact there is a gauge invariant notion of gravitational waves carrying energy, that was a big landmark. Uh, and I have to say that particle physicists couldn't understand this because they always just worked in the linearized approximation, where of course it's clear that gravitational waves exist. The whole question was whether because of diffeomorphism invariance, that you know the notion of gravitational wave just loses its meaning, and this is what Bondi has said for sure. So Bondi, a remark that is attributed to him, his famous remark is that yes, gravitational waves are real; they emit, they carry energy, and you can hit water with them, <laughs> which is of course not true, but I mean, which is true if you are close, sufficiently close to the source, but not 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 with the source is very far away. So this really changed the whole paradigm. And um, since the from, from the 60s, mid 60s on, then people took the gravitational waves very seriously. Now it looks ridiculous. How could people debate about this? But everything is ridiculous in retrospect. Uh, one needs clean framework to describe it. And you had asked me a question a while ago about why not do what we do in cosmology. And again, in the last part of the course, we're going to see what we do in cosmology. The reason is because in cosmology, everything is done only in the linearized approximation or in the weak field approximation. When we are not doing gravitational waves in full nonlinear general relativity, we're not talking about gravitational waves which are produced by in spiraling black holes, for example, which are very strong sources that are created. And to understand if gravitational waves exist beyond the linearized or beyond some kind of approximation, linearized or second order linearized approximation in full general relativity, we needed this framework, and this is what clarified that gravitational waves do exist. Okay. Now, 
So we got this formula for energy momentum, and I, I don't want to go into angular momentum because it's much more subtle. As we saw for the angular momentum already at the level of um, um, uh, symmetries, uh, whereas the Poincare group has only four parameter family of Lorentz groups, the BMS group has infinitely infinite parameter family of Lorentz groups. It does have a unique translation, four-dimensional translation group, therefore the notion of energy and momentum is well defined, but the notion of angular momentum acquires a new kind of uh, ambiguity or it has to be enlarged in a suitable sense and that is much more technical, so I will not discuss that. We will just stay with, angular, with the linear momentum here, energy and momentum. Okay, so this is the basically what we saw last time. Now what we would like to see, see is show is that in fact um, uh, the relation between with what we did <coughs> relation to the peeling. So early on, when we began gravitational waves, in order to make the analogy with electromagnetism clear, what I've done was I looked at the wire tensor, we use the field equations and the definition of wild tensor and showed that wild tensor had a certain fall off and because Kra has a topology of two sphere in fact we are appealing we said that psi zero with the component of wild tensor falls off as one upon r psi one falls like um, sorry the other way around psi four falls like one upon r psi three falls like one upon r squared psi two falls like one upon r cubed and so on we had seen and now what we would like to know is what is the relation between these derivative operators and the wild tensor. And the statement is that the relation is rather simple. Again, let me get the numerical factor right. Um, yes. So if I take, you see, in going from here to here, we lost some information because I'm lowering this index with a metric Q and Q is degenerate. So this tensor has a slightly more information than this tensor. And so we, the full content of the Riemann tensor in three dimensions is really in this 1, 1 tensor that we got up here. So let us just look at that 1, 1 tensor up here. So it has some algebraic, additional algebraic symmetries, such as when I lower the index, what I get up here at automatically satisfies SAB is symmetric. And it also satisfies SAB and B equal to 0, or if you like, even the SAB and B up here portion to NB and so on. It has some symmetries. Right? At the moment, then these are not important, but let me just tell you that this tensor with certain symmetries is what contains the full information about this one tensor. These symmetries can be derived just from the proper fact that it's, it's, a, it's a curvature tensor. There's nothing new. I mean, I'm not using anything, uh, uh, anything profound about it. It's a, the derivative operator, I know that it's a metric and an NA, and this is the curvature tensor of that derivative operator. From there, it follows that the Riemann tensor, because we're in three dimensions, there is no y tensor, Riemann tensor of this form, where this s determines therefore the Riemann tensor completely, because this s is just a low index lower version of this x, this s, and uh, this s has some symmetry. Now, the point is that what happens, the Bianchi identity is implied. In the, in the conformally completed space time, they actually give you relation between this tensor S and the Y tensor. And what we can one can show is this is just a fact. There are many things in here that I'm just telling you. We also did a similar thing in the black holes towards the end of the discussion because it, it, it will take too long to do it in class. It's not difficult. I, I give references, and here also I give you references. So the BMK identities in space time apply. That in fact, if I take epsilon AMN times DM, just take a derivative, like a curl type of derivative, DNB, if I take this, then this is equal to actually, let me just call it star KB in space. So if you like here, this is a definition of star KB, but in space time term, it is exactly what you expect. It is limit to scratch of omega to the minus one times CM. B and So this is exactly what we call KB CD tensor. We saw that from the space-time perspective, we saw that 
this wild tensor vanishes on sky, but for omega to the minus one times the wild tensor has actually a limit, and that is the limit that we call we call K B C D. So the statement is that this derivative operator that determines this tensor B, uh, this tensor S up here, and this this curvature of the derivative operator. If I take another derivative, and if you like, this automatically skewed because of M up here, then this particular combination determines some components of the wild tensor. So what are these components in terms of the, I mean, you can just check it by just using the newman penrose tetra and making contractions. What the information in this case, star KB, is precisely what we call psi 4 naught, psi 3 naught, and imaginary part of psi 3 So these are five components. Of the 10 components, five are completely determined by this, by this derivative operator. But this radiative operator, derivative operator is what represents the radiative mode. So if you like, these five components, they carry information about radiation. They are determined completely by the radiative modes, so they carry information only about radiation up here. So if you have stationary space-time, for example, these components will all be zero. There will be no radiation there. These components are all identically zero. Okay. So now the statement is that, uh, and, and in particular, this psi 4 naught up here, we saw that is it, psi 4 naught is equal to, this is the, uh, the path of KABCD physical K B C D that falls off as one upon R and this is what we call radiation P. Remember the Maxwell field, this was analogous. Uh, this I for naught is analogous to a Maxwell field, find two naught, which also was a radiation field. So cipher not is was the radiant field, and now therefore it is interesting to ask. We can write now the cipher not psi three not imagine part of psi two not in terms of this derivative operator explicitly. And I, I could write down the formulae, but the most interesting thing for us is cipher not. And it turns out that the cipher not. Remember what is cipher not? Let us just write it first. Cipher not is equal to hat sky. I put hat now. The reason is because. I the, this, some quantities are in physical space time, some quantities are in scry, so I put a hat. So you evaluate this quantity at, at scry, which is KABCD times NA M bar B and C M bar D. So this was our psi for naught on scry. So this is the this is, so this psi for naught is a function, it's evaluated at scry. So it is a function of U theta phi. This is this is what this cipher not is. So it just lives on scribe here. And then one can ask what is the relation with this derivative operator? In particular, we saw that the derivative operator can be expressed entirely in terms of the shear. What is its relation with the shear? So last time we saw that we can construct um, just the, uh, the spin vector quantity that people generally construct, sigma naught. And that is supposed to be just equal to the shear sigma AB times MA and bar MA and B. It has spin weight 2. And similarly, we can construct news. For some reason, people don't put a knot there, so I will not put a knot. News, which is MAB, MA and B. And then what we saw was that there was a relation between the two, namely, the news tensor is just the time derivative of the shear. So this is just equal to d by du of the shear. So we have got shear tensor and its time derivative gives us a news. And the time derivative of shear tensor therefore gives us, tells us how much energy and momentum is carried by the gravitational waves. What about psi 4 naught? Well, it turns out that the psi 4 naught, just by definition, it has two m bars, so it has a spin weight minus two, because it has two m bars. And the statement is that this quantity is just given by 
um, minus that side to be sigma bar that we love now. This is a sigma, complex conjugate involved because this is a spin weight one. This is uh, sorry, this is a spin weight two. This is spin weight minus two. So of course, it's a complex conjugation involved. The psi is just a various conventions about how psi for naught is defined. So we see that the first derivative of the shear tensor is the is the body news that really is carrying information about energy, momentum, and such thing. If the body news is not is equal to zero in a space time, then there is no energy that is carried back by by uh, by by waves, by, by energy and momentum carried by waves up here. The space time doesn't have any loss of energy momentum due to gravitational, gravitational waves. And what we see now here is that the wild tensor component, which we call the radiation field, is just the first derivative of the news, the complex conjugate, or the second derivative of this shear up here. So, now this is really important because what people do now in numerical relativity, so binary black holes or binary compact binaries, let me emphasize black holes. When we study compact binaries, so for example, you could have two neutron stars which are going around each other. Now, when these neutron stars are going around each other, or two black holes which are going around each other, so it's a certain system, physical system, and you can calculate the quadruple moment of this system. And because they're going around each other, the quadruple moment of this system is changing in time. It's basically because Maxwell field is a vector field, it's, it has spin one in physics language, therefore it is a dipole moment that is changing that gives rise to Maxwell radiation field, the radiation of Maxwell field, or if you like, that emits photons, because photons carry spin one. Gravitons or gravitational waves correspond to, gravitons correspond to, but they in perturbative quantum gravity, gravitons correspond to spin two particles, or radiative modes of gravitational field, also in a well-defined way, defined sense, however, um, um, have a quadrupolar structure. So you need some quadrupolar moment which is changing in time. Normally we think of a star which is you know, oscillating and emitting gravitational waves, and that is correct. But it's also true that if I got these two black holes or two neutron stars, I can look at the total system, and because it is the, to the orbit of the, the, or the, the total orbit up here is such that the quadruple moment of the system is actually changing in time. Therefore, the gravitational waves are being emitted by conservation of energy. Then, in fact, the the, the, the system is going to the, the two stars or the two black holes are going to fall slightly towards each other. This is a very slow process, but when they are sufficiently close, then it's a, it enters a non-linear non regime and then the process is very quick. And therefore, these black holes and neutron stars finally coalesce, co um, merge, and at that merger, there's a huge amount of gravitational waves that are emitted. I mean, typically, for example, that um, the, the very first um, merger that we saw, the, the total mass was about 60 solar masses of the two black holes, and about two or three solar masses were actually re emitted in the form of gravitational waves. Now, E equal to mc squared is the energy that is emitted, and c is huge. Therefore, the total amount of energy that is radiated in this collision is absolutely huge. How huge? Well, at that, in the, in the few milliseconds after the collision, the amount of radiation, amount of energy that gravitational waves carry, outshines the amount of energy that, that is emitted by all stars in the entire universe via electromagnetic radiation. Solar mass energy is a huge energy. So two or three solar mass energy is really huge, huge energy. I mean, what is happening near those, in, in that region, is a veritable tsunami, right? I mean, the space-time curvature is oscillating like crazy and something. But of course, luckily, this event is very far from us, right? This event, the first one event that took place, took place when Earth was still spawning uh, first multicellular life, it was more than a billion years ago. And therefore, you know, it was billion light years ago uh, away, and therefore, you know, by the time it comes up here, then because of this one upon R fall off of the radiation field up here, <coughs> this, the signal is very weak. But at near the source, the signal is actually very huge. So what happens with this compact binary is how do we analyze them? 
We numerical, when we use two things, we use numerical, and we use, so, analysis. When they are very far away, we can use weak field approximation, the general relativity, and use this so-called post-Newtonian methods. So these are, gravity is nearly Newtonian, with corrections, and these are methods which are analytic, and we can use this approximation very well. Well, when they get close, then we have to use nonlinear full Einstein's equation, and therefore people use, we use numerical relativity to analyze this. So what do people do? Well, people are typically saying that, well, you take a Cauchy surface, so if you like P equal to constant surface in physical space time, and you have got these two objects which are going around each other. So you want to give initial data here for these two objects. So the initial data will consist of the metric on, the, on this manifold, um, that we call it HAB, the first and the second fundamental forms. So the metric and the extrinsic curvature on this manifold, this is the initial data. So this is symmetric, they satisfy some constraints. If they are black hole, then that's all we give. Now how do I know that they are black hole? Well, I go and look for this initial data and find in fact that around here, there are marginally trapped surfaces. So I got some bunch of region in which there are marginally trapped surfaces and this is our boundary of black hole at an instant of time, if you like. And then we evolve this. We evolve this, then this is going to go into a dynamical horizon. But since they are very far in the beginning, in this region, they are almost like isolated horizons because they are not changing in time very much. There is not much energy that is falling into the black hole. Or, and then, but when they enter this regime, they become, it really is a dynamical horizon that we saw up here. So common dynamical horizon forms, so then, so here I got two marginal trapped surfaces enveloping, and then finally I got, actually we also have little marginal trapped surfaces around them, but there's a common marginal trapped surface that, that forms at a later instant of time. So t equal to t naught, at a later instant of time t equal to t1. Actually I got these two objects with little marginal trapped surfaces around each of them, but the important thing is that there's a common marginal trapped surface that develops. That is when the black holes are merged, when the common ones develops up here. And then the statement is that we, so this is actually obtained, I mean the numerical relativity is needed somewhere big before the common horizon actually forms. And then this common horizon settles down, and there is a lot of radiation that is emitted up in this region up here, just when the common horizon is formed, black holes are merged, and then these black holes settle down, finally, so they settle down. to occur black hole with radiation which is going out. Here also radiation is going out but it's weak. Now the radiation is strong. This strong radiation as it going out, uh, it, is, it is emitted. In the beginning, the marginally trapped surface that we have got has all kinds of multiple moments that I have told you about. It's very crinkly. As the, it loses radiation, this it loses crinkliness, if you like, sometimes one says it loses its hair, and it becomes smoother and smoother, and finally, it just settles down to the curved dynamical horizon. So to begin with, the multiple moments are very complicated, and then the multiple moments are very simple. They are the curved multiple moments determined by just the mass and angular momentum. So this is a process up here that is happening, and so there's a final step up here after merger, we can again use linear theory, linear, linear, linear general relativity, but now linearization is about the final curse solution. So there's a post Newtonian phase where the things are very far, then close to the, then the merger occurs, close to the merger and soon after the merger, 
We really need full-fledged non-linear general relativity. And this is important, and this took a long, long, you know, 25, 30 years to develop all the numerical methods and match them with mathematical theory of hyperbolic and elliptic differential equations and so on, and to, to extract information from it using, for example, notions of isolated and dynamical horizons. And then finally, uh, we have got this merger, the post-merger phase, where again, the black hole is just essentially curved, is set, but it's sort of slightly perturbed because of things that are falling into it, and it finally, in the asymptotic, it will just become curved. And that, this phase, is given by the linear history. So we got these three phases. So what do people do then? People, the most interesting part of the signal, you have, all of you have seen this LIGO signals hundreds of times by now, um, first, first starting about two years ago, right, when the first announcement was made, we had this press conference, uh, LSF had the press conference, and we all met, and those of you who were here, we met in the, uh, in the mathematics building, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the seminar room there, where it was broadcast, it was broadcast all over the world, a very exciting event, and we saw this waveform. So what the hell is that waveform, right? You know, what did we, what, what is that supposed to do? What does it have to do with theory? That waveform is just the sigma. So the waveform that is actually formed, that is actually plotted in this merger is this sigma. So what do we do? And please ask me the question as soon as I'm done up here. Uh, what is it that is plotted? You take numerical relativity, work on the space time geometry, starting with this initial data of two black holes, and then we are looking at look at this side for plot. So there's a wild asymptotic wild tensor. The cipher knot is, as we saw here, is the part of the asymptotic of the wild tensor that falls like one upon R in the radiation field. So that's what people actually extract, that's what they calculate. And from this cipher knot, we can extract the shear by this equation that we got. Cipher knot is equal to the second time derivative of shear. And what is shown in these plots is this either cipher node or shear, typically the shear. The waveform that is plotted up here is the shear. So, in terms of conceptual foundations, or in, in terms of mathematical relativity, what we calculate is this. What happens in LIGO detector? Well, the waveform that so extracts I, and this is what is plotted. To represent the waveform. From the theoretical side, But from the detector point of view, experimental point of view, what we are plotting is strain in the detector. When the gravitational waves goes by, the detector arms are that are perpendicular to each other, and they are slightly contracted, slightly elongated, and then after, after a, you know, in time. These, these oscillate, that oscillate in a familiar quadrupolar manner that you have seen in many, many books, your first course in relativity. Um, so that is what, what is actually plotting. So the question now is, what is the relation between what is new, theoretically plotted, which is shear, with this strain? This is the question that we want to ask, and that is the last part that I want to do. And then I'll take questions. So for this, I have to make a little shift. And so far what we have done is, we are done. Yeah. I guess you might be actually addressing it now, but um, I was wondering what the relation between shear is. If there's an easy relation between shear and the linearized gravitational. Yeah, yeah that's the next part. Okay. So, so that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to make a shift to talk about linearized gravitational field, uh, just for a, shot, for a second. This is also the way that I planned the course, because what we did was, I assume that you have taken first course in relativity, so you know about linear, linear as gravity, so I didn't want to start with that and repeat it, but rather we're doing it the other way around. 
we started with full theory and then after arriving at the linearized theory. And this is also good because then it will make a smooth transition to cosmology where one is using linearized perturbation theory. So, what we, I want to make a change the gears a little bit and remind you of linearized general relativity and gravitational waves in this theory. And then what I'm going to come back and see what is the sigma naught in terms of this linearized gravitational field, exactly the question that Sina was asking just a minute ago. Again, let me get the convention straight, well, I guess, to begin with. So what we have is a background space-time. So this is like a D2 just for a second, and then we're going to make connection. Okay. So here we're going to background space-time, which is just Minkowski space. And what we were looking at is linearized gravity. And for simplicity, I'm just going to use no sources because we're interested in waves. If you're interested in post Newtonian approximation, then sources are, of course, critical. But for waves, they're not critical, so let me not assume any sources. So what we do is the following. There are two ways of thinking about it. We can say that, well, I got a metric, GAB, physical metric, which is equal to eta, eta hat AB plus some small parameter epsilon times gamma. AB. Okay, I can say that. Or I, I, I like to think about it as really what we have is a one parent family of metrics, which are all solutions to source P Einstein's equations. At the parameter value zero, you have got the Minkowski metric. And then we're interested in the first order of perturbation. So if you like, you're got a manifold of solutions, and first order of perturbations are just tangent vectors at any solution I mean, in this manifold. So the statement here is that I just take d by d lambda of g d of lambda, and evaluate lambda equal to zero, and this is what we define to be gamma. So I can just calculate, actually these are two ways, different ways of doing it. Uh, with doing it this way, then you know you can go to any order you want. You can take further derivatives, d2 by d lambda square, d3 by d lambda square. You can go further, further approximations as you, as you go along. Okay. So then the question is, what are the, what do Einstein's equation become? And again, this is something that I show you have seen in your first course in general relativity, linearized approximation, and then the linearized Einstein's equations. So basically, you're taking d d lambda of G D B of lambda equal to so G A B of lambda is always equal to zero because our source is source free Einstein's equation. So Einstein tensor always vanishes for all these metrics. And therefore I can take G D lambda, G A B of lambda at zero, and that gives me a differential equation on this gamma hat. And what is that equation that we get? Well, we get here this, we get this identically. So this is equal to zero, and what is this when you evaluate it? You just get this to be equal to minus one half times mod not hat. Let me call it, let me make too many symbols, but let me just do it, gamma hat AB plus gamma not, gamma not B. So there's a, there's a bar and hat. Hat just means that there are physical space time, and I'll explain what bar means in a minute. Um, yeah, bar. B, yeah. C minus one half. Eta hat A B. So where gamma bar hat is just trace reverse gamma, so this object is just equal to gamma hat AB minus one minus gamma hat which is uh, minus trace, it just trace reversed. So there's a half factor. There was a half Okay, 
So it's just stress reverse at the moment. Uh, this is not going to be terribly important at the moment that it's stress reverse because as you know, there's a gauge freedom. If, you, if anybody wants to know about this more detail, I will explain to you. But this gauge freedom just corresponds to uh, gamma hat AB goes to gamma hat AB plus two times symmetrized derivative of any vector field. Or if you like, this is the same as D derivative of uh, um, the metric in a. This is just expressing the fact that if morphisms are, are gauge transformations, I think yes, most of you have seen this like in, the, in, the, in your general courses. So you are using this gauge freedom in a source free case, you can first of all say that impose gauge condition. In other words, we got this gauge freedom, I choose this zeta suitably in order to make simplify the form of gamma hat up here. And then I can make gamma hat AB, first of all, spatial. So we got here Minkowski space time. I choose some t equal to constant surfaces. I got here t hat AB, t hat A is a unit time like vector. So I just make only the spatial component of it non zero the space-time component zero, and I can also make it gamma hat AB times E hat AB equal to zero. So this is traceless. So it is purely spatial and trace traceless, and this is often called the radiation gauge. Uh, actually, I, I, I do two things. I should say first up here. Using this freedom, first of all, I can simplify the equation to use a Lorentz gauge condition. But gauge condition which says that there are half D, gamma hat C D equal to zero. This Lorentz gauge condition. With this Lorentz gauge condition, then this term disappears. This term disappears because it's a flat derivative operator, it comes in, kills this. So I don't get anything here. I don't get any so I'm only then left with this um, one half. I'm just left with the equation, which is the wave equation. I should have said this before. Using this gauge freedom, we can first do this. It still leaves a gauge freedom where now zeta is a function of the wave, uh, is satisfied the wave equation, and using this restricted gauge freedom. You can use the restricted gauge freedom to make gamma hat both spatial and trace free. Once you are done all this, satisfying the gauge, this gauge, this gauge, the final outcome is is that gamma, first of all, gamma bar hat a is equal to the same as gamma AB. <coughs> bar is the same as that because trace is zero, and the two differ from each other just by trace. So they are, they are the same. And then, furthermore, the Lorentz gauge condition and distance, and, and furthermore, it is, it is spatial. So it has only indices in the space like direction. And finally, the Lorentz gauge condition and the spatiality, they are just their space that, in fact, in fact, it is diverges free. So in the three dimensions, this tensor is actually diverges free. Um, and, and of course, we already know it's trace free because we have imposed that condition. So, in addition to that, gamma at AB, and AB position. So, finally, the statement is that the linearized gravitational field representing a source free solution, that for waves, gravitational waves, they can be represented completely by a spatial tensor which is symmetric, which is, which is transverse satisfies this, this gauge condition up here and stressless. So this is all often called, as I said before, the Lorentz gauge. And then this condition up here is often called radiation gauge. This addition, the additional conditions are imposed up here um, using the restricted gauge freedom. Those are called the radiation gauge. So ultimately, I am in the 
radiation gauge and Lorenz gauge together, and then the what I have is just here. I got a spatial tensor which is symmetric. It has six component. Okay, that's one here. But it's transverse, so three of the components are killed. So I'm left only with three components. And finally, it's traceless, so I'm only left with two components. So this transverse traceless, so therefore gamma hat AB is often just written as gamma hat AB. Gamma hat AB, transverse traceless. So this is often the, the notation that people use, transverse traceless, and that is because all these conditions are satisfied. I know that this is a lightning review, but I think that you have all seen this several times, and so it's okay. Are there any questions? People have not seen it and they have questions, please ask me now. Okay, so these are the, these are. Now what we can do is to do, this is the linearized gravitational field, and what we would like to know is, what is the relation between all these transverse traceless force that I've talked about here, and the shear that I've talked about here. Here, the full non-linear relativity, the two radiative degrees of freedom are encoded in the shear. They determine, as we just saw, this psi 4 naught, psi 3 naught, and the major part of psi 2 naught. They give us the bonding news, they tell us how much energy is radiated and all that. So where is that information here? It looks like over here, again I got two independent components, the two functions on a three-dimensional manifold, because I'm looking at a t equal to constant surface, so I get two functions on these two independent manifolds. What are the two functions? They are just the components of the transverse traceless symmetric tensor field on this manifold. But at SCRI, we also had kind of the components of sigma AB. Sigma AB up here. And this sigma AB was symmetric, was transverse to NA, and it was traceless. Again, I got two, com two free components and here we also have two free components. But what is the relation between the two? You see it's not obvious what the relation between the two is and this again people who do linearized gravity so it's, so it's important to understand this point. The reason why it's not obvious is because this decomposition namely transverse here where transversality means really diverges free condition up here. These conditions are very non-local. If you give me gamma hat AB on this three-dimensional surface, symmetric tensor field, and ask me what is its transverse traceless part, it involves a non-local operation, which involves inverse powers of Laplacians, etc., to give you this, this part. If you like, normally it is done just by taking the Fourier, tra tra Fourier transform. Right? You go to the Fourier space, and then this just says, that the Fourier transform of gamma at AB is perpendicular to K. This is, is a space free. So this quantity is local in the Fourier space, but it's very non-local in the physical space. Whereas our quantity up here is completely local in the physical space. So at first it looks like, well, we're comparing apples and oranges. It's true, there are two transverse traceless modes, and then what, what are they happening? What is the relation between the two? And the point is that. Quite often, people in the literature is full of standard books, Mesner Thorn Wheeler, Poisson Will, um, the various books, right? They, they discuss these transverse traceless things. And they have two notions of transverse traceless in the physical space tank. They don't refer to scry. This is one notion, and then they introduce another notion, which is just local in the physical space time. That space notion, which is just local in the physical space time, if you take the limit of scry, you get this. But they, they ask, they, they basically confuse two completely distinct notions in the physical space-time and call them both transverse traceless. One is this, and then the second notion, which I've not written down, but let me just tell you that it is local in physical space-time, and therefore it's quite different from it. And that notion directly goes over to this kind of notion of scry, because this is also local in physical space-time. But a nice surprise is that precisely because when you go to scry, you go out to null directions. So I got some source up here. And radiation is going out here. And I got scry 
here. And I'm going out in null directions up here. I'm going out in I plus. This is sky minus. I'm not interested in sky minus. I'm just looking at sky plus up here. I'm going out in null directions up here. So as we go out up here, what we're do, doing is you're going along u equal to u naught. And then we can take this gamma hat AD. And I can do power series expansion. Up on up on up. So gamma at AB to begin with is a function of u r theta phi. And I can do a power series expansion in power of one upon r. And the non-trivial result is that in fact, in Minkowski space, about which I'm doing this linearization, the shear of L and also of L is identically zero because this L is just a vector field which is just outgoing, it's just a pure expansion, there's nothing shearing. They are just light rays emanating one point. The shear is identically zero. But given this gamma at AB, we can calculate what is linearized shear. We can calculate what is delta sigma. So the shear with respect to eta AB is just zero. But shear with respect to the linearized metric, where, where I got this gamma hat AB itself, is not zero. And you can actually calculate what it is. It's not a very difficult calculation, but you, you have to do it cleverly. When you do that calculation, what we find is that, in fact, um, the sigma, two times sigma up here, two times sigma up here, okay, two times linearized shear, at sky, the linearized shear at sky turns out to be precisely uh, gamma hat transverse spaceless AB, where transverse spaceless is this non-local operation in physical space-time that I've done. Okay, but still is that operation times n bar a bar b. <coughs> so, the point is that the two transverse trace test modes up here are precisely the ones in the shear. I'll say it once again, and then please ask me questions. What we did first is not worry about linearized gravity. We did just full general relativity. And we saw that the radiative modes are all encoded in the shear tensor, where the shear is calculated with respect to the vector field L that we got here. You will suppress it because we always use this with respect to the vector field L or, or one form L on sky. So that's good. When we do linearized gravity, in the books you will see that one says that the radiative modes, the two modes which correspond to this, this, this deformation of a bunch of test particles going like that or like that, I cannot do it with the hand very well, the thing that you have seen many, many times, that is all done in terms of gamma. And the question is, the full theory where I got shear, here we got the linearized metric, what is the relationship between the two? And the statement is that if you go to the transverse space tensor gauge, and if I take the limit of this gamma, so I take the limit of this gamma at AB, transverse space tensor, u theta phi, and I expand it out as something like not AB u theta phi divided by r plus something gamma one transverse space this AB uh, upon r squared uh, is again u theta phi, etc. I do a power of expansion r r squared, then the limiting field that I get is this is gamma naught. And the statement is that this gamma naught is the same as the shear in a very precise sense. Namely, if I extract the, the spin weight uh, 
two quantity from here, then the spin, the spin, spin by two quantity from, that is extracted from this linearized metric gives me precisely the linear ratio. Yeah? So what happens, I guess, what happens with this non-locality and locality? Yeah, so, exactly. So what happened with non-locality? So the statement is, I mean, we can, it will take a while to do it properly. But if I, if I take this surface like that, it's very non-local in this surface up here. This non-locality basically disappears. Or if you like this non-locality, this notion of transfer spaceless just becomes this notion of transfer spaceless in this specific limit. It's not true. You know, if I take a, if I take a limit as you go t goes to infinity, then that non-locality is not going to disappear. Yes. At each time, there's going to be this non-locality. But if I'm taking the limit as u goes to u naught, and r goes to infinity, and do this power series expansion, it's just a mathematical fact that the two non, two transverse spaceless modes that are there in the physical space-time, in the limit to scry, become just local. And this is another beauty of scry, actually. Right? That's another way to say it. Things just simplify here at scry. You can just do various operations in the physical space-time without having to go to the moment of space if you just leave on sky. So it is not a trivial statement, but it's a true statement. I mean, it's not a trivial statement. It's clear because, because the books never discuss this, right? I mean, all the books have there's a somewhat confused treatment about the transfer space space modes in the books. Yeah. So you write delta sigma, delta with respect to what? So we compute sigma intrinsically at sky. So what no. is this delta with respect to? Good. So. I got here a one parallel family of metric G B of lambda. G A B of lambda. I do conformal completion, I get a one parameter family of matrix G A B of lambda. Each of them gives me sigma sigma A B, but let me just say sigma at lambda. So I take D D lambda of sigma lambda. Lambda equals zero. This is the linearized shear. This is completely determined. by the linearized metric gamma and AB, because it's just the linearized shear. It is this linearized shear that I'm calling delta sigma. Okay. So if you like, or if, if you do the power of the expansion, if you think of GAB as eta AB plus epsilon gamma hat AB, then I'm just, I'm given this matrix, but of course there will be, yeah, I'm given this matrix up here, and then I'm just looking at keeping terms only linear in epsilon in the calculation of sigma. The term, so this metric has some sigma, but that, that, that scry, and I'm just look, keeping the terms which are linear in epsilon, and that is what I'm calling delta sigma. I had to do this because I'm just comparing what happens with full theory with the linearized theory. So obviously, I had to linearize somewhere, and I'm linearizing here, and this is the linearized metric up here. That, that equation is just linearization of the Bianchi identity, right? Is that, this, this equation? Yeah. Is that true? No. Okay. It's not a Bianchi identity. It's just a, it's a fact about the solutions to Einstein's to linear solutions to Einstein's equation as you're taking the limit. In, no, it's not, it's not something trivial. Okay. Because it's something that really has to do with this amalgamation of two things, namely, this is the notion of transverse traceless, which is very non-local and such thing up here. But, I'm taking a certain limit. I'm taking a limit as u equal to u naught, and then keeping the leading term in R. So, so that is that is a statement that is that. So it's not, it doesn't come from from B I K. It is really has to do with this detailed thing that we did, uh, which has to do with fixing a certain gauge, doing things, and so the modes that are extracted here, the physical space. These, these are extracted in the physical space time, but at infinity they become the same as the modes which are extracted at scry. And as you said, it's a highly non-trivial statement because as cry, it is all local in means it's a boundary, but still it is local in space-time. Whereas at each instant of time t, it is extremely non-local in space-time. It is because it, it, this limiting procedure can drop the non-locality and expresses and allows me to express something which is intrinsically non-local in physical space-time in terms of local things at scry. Uh, you have a question, Martin? Oh yeah. That's Okay. So the statement is that it is this linearized metric that is, being, that, that is captured in sigma, 
And I think, again, I just leave to you that you saw this in the first course in general relativity, that when you studied linearized metrics, that when we have got this linearized metric solution, that is a solution that, given a ring of circular test particles, if that's better the way to do it, given a ring of circular test particles, you have got this mode, you know, and the, the other mode, which I cannot do with my fingers, and we've got this other, other polarization mode. Those modes are all done in terms of this gamma. The same modes appear in terms of the sigma because of this non-trivial relation between full nonlinear general relativity and its linearized approximation. This exists in full nonlinear general relativity. I don't have to use any linearized approximation. This, of course, is in the linearized approximation. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that you in the non the numerical relativities plot the sigma naught, but that depends on a gauge choice of m, right? So what, what do you Right. Use? Very good. So, yeah. So we had to, yeah, that's a very good question. So, in the whole construction, we had to construct uh, Newman Penrose tetrad, and all of these things have to do with you know do we have the right Newman Penrose tetrad? So that really refers to um, having this. As you saw before, to construct the tetrad, you got scry and I need a cross section. Once I got cross section, I can do all that. So the question is, where is this cross-section coming from? So the point up here is that, I mean, conceptually, what is happening is that in this phase, when things are very far away, very early times, or in this phase, at very late times, the radiation has died out. When the radiation has died out, you do get these cross-sections, which are zero shear. Okay. There are cross-sections which are shear. But if I just wiggle that cross section, it is not zero. There exists cross section with zero shear. If it's a sigma dot is equal to zero, nu is equal to zero, and radius, then there exists cross section which are equal to zero. So we can take these cross sections where which are shear free, either in the future or in the past. And then once you give this cross section before the, the burst of radiation comes, say for example, and then or after the black hole has settled down. And then the statement is that you can, then you can construct a Newman Penrose tetrad associated with, when, once you give me a cross section, then I know what, how to construct a Newman Penrose tetrad. And that is a Newman Penrose tetrad that, that in principle computing. What I'm presenting here is, what is the mathematical and conceptual basis of what they do? Of course, when they actually do things, they use many approximations further. I mean, they cannot go all the way to scry, they go to a sufficiently large radius where one upon R can be extracted numerically because one upon r squared is sufficiently small that you can ignore it, or if you like, you work with some in, in that approximation up here. So there are, there are additional approximations that are coming in which you have to stare at and see that they are okay. But of course, you know, they, are, they, are, they have studied these things, so they know how to extract these waves and there's a lot of. I mean, it was confusing in the beginning, but 30 years have passed. People have studied this in great detail. They know how to do it. But conceptually, what one is doing is really waiting until all the radiation has passed away, then I know what, what good cross-sections are, shear-free cross-sections are, and then use a Newman Penrose tetrad based on those cross-sections, and then that is what one is called plotting in terms of shear. Avi? Yeah, I have, I have not understand something. Maybe I'm missing something stupid. So, you said the sigma naught is somehow the derivative of the metric, right? But in the expression delta sigma that you have, Oh, because they want to honor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's very confusing. It's very confusing. But your point is extremely confusing. But it's because of that one upon R. That is what takes care of that. Okay. Sorry. This is this is equation needed in relation between a sigma and, and gamma. Requires the use of, of, of Minkowski at yeah. scribe class. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Our, our stationary space time, but I was just using Minkowski for. So I, I could do, do stationary space time, but I. I uh, okay. But, 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 people, but people almost always do this transfer space less decomposition in the Minkowski space in every book and such thing. They don't do it on a, on a stationary space time. That's why I didn't want to go into uh, that thing. So in, in this language, um, we are in Minkowski right. when, when uh, we are looking for this. Right. Time. Right. In this language, we are in Minkowski space time. We're sufficiently far away. And that was really related to the question he was asking, which Minkowski? Well, we are in that Minkowski which is selected by what happens in the distant future. So what happens in the distant future is really stationary space time, but 
that, 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 that is the, that stationary space time is the same as Minkowski space time. As I said before, I could do everything in stationary space time, but just to make contact with what is done in the books, I'm not making a contact with what is happening in Minkowski space time. Um, uh, physically, there is happening something, we have a detector, we are in Minkowski, so morally we are in uh, Scali. Yeah, morally we are in Scali. <laughs> and then we can uh, match. Right. We're sufficiently far, and not just we are because of Minkowski, but we are sufficiently far from the source so that we are in the radiation zone with respect to the. If, if something happened in the solar system, uh, we, you know, of course it would be destroyed completely, but, <laughs> but we could not use this, uh, this description. Okay, so I'll stay here. I know people have to go to classes. Um, those of you who want, you want to see me, I think we can meet after, after the, afterwards because you know, those who have classes. But we're done with the gravitational waves, and I want to begin next time completely fresh with the cosmology. But we'll make kind of a contact with these gravitational waves, this linearized theory, when we go to cosmology. I need to know a couple of things from you. First is, how many people here are familiar, uh, or are familiar with the, you know, the standard Friedman, Robertson, Walker cosmology? Everybody is familiar. Great. How many of you are familiar with um, quantum field theory in Minkowski space time? Just you know, creation, annihilation, operands, etc. Okay, very wonderful. Okay. And then the last question was, how many of you are familiar with cosmological perturbation theory? Not everybody. Okay, so with, this is very helpful for me. I will organize my course accordingly. I put a lot of, uh, the homework is, first homework is due on, on Tuesday, and then another second one is due, so first homework is due on Wednesday, and the second one is going to be due a week from Wednesday. These are the homeworks on gravitational waves. We'll have one more homework on cosmology, and finally, uh, please think about the term papers, those who are registered for the course to write, and uh, they will be due um, on the last day, uh, Friday, of the, of the, the last Friday of the semester. So, so please, again, there have to be about five pages, five to ten pages, up to you. Uh, how, how much you want? So uh, it's uh, due before the last week, or like no. in, in the final week, or? No, the, 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 the final week you should do presentation. Okay. Okay. So therefore, do it. Try to give it to me on Friday, uh, and we'll we'll set up uh, the presentation panel. Just want to remind everybody again that this Friday we're going to have a class. That was the making up of the class that we missed.